afternoon. Stand with me. We're going to sing number 357, Work for the Night is Coming. We're going to sing all three verses, number 357. Must have been in that. Uh, we just taught on Matthew 24 in my Sunday school class, talking about the return of the Lord and the rapture of the church and all that good stuff. And uh, the last thing I said in class was, "Look busy, Jesus is coming soon." Amen. And funny, my my phone even picked that up when I looked at it. It had all these pictures. Look busy, Jesus is coming soon. All right. You don't want to just be looking busy. You want to be genuinely engaged in the work of the Lord. That's what's going to matter. This isn't, you know, killing time in the office cubicle, uh, putting in eight hours of time, but only working four and a half of them. We're not talking about that. We're talking about making a difference. Amen. Why play at it? Why play at church? Why play at serving God? Let's mean business for the Lord. And I think you do, or you wouldn't be here tonight. Amen. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we love you, and we're thankful to be in your house again. Thank you that uh, we're able to meet. There are many who are unable, and yet we're here. Some are home. They're uh, concerned about their health and for very good reasons, and so they're choosing to stay home and watch us tonight. Would you bless them and help them? And we pray that things would get back to normal soon so that they could rejoin us again. And some are shut in, and we're unable to even go by and see them. Lord, would you help us to make sure their needs are met? Would you please take care of them? protect them through this time. Those of us who are healthy, we pray you'd keep us healthy, Lord. Help us to uh, continue to do the things that you'd have us to do. We pray that we'd be able to make the most of the time and ability that we have to make a difference for you. I pray you get a hold of the heart of the people of, these, of our country and of the world. And I pray that folks would come to Christ because of what we're seeing happen around the globe. We love you trust your presence is with us tonight for you promised it would be for two or more gathered together in my name there will I be in the midst of them thank you for that father we love you we ask this in Christ's name tonight amen, amen. stay standing we won't do our handshake time but let's go ahead and sing the chorus he is Lord we'll sing it through twice and then I'll let you be seated number 35 he is Lord number three five together. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead and he is Lord. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. All right, we're going to sing it one more time at 
I want you to sing it like he is Lord. Can you do that for me? Let's sing it one more time. He is Lord. Start with me. He is Lord. He is Lord. Let's hear it. He is risen from the dead and he is Lord. Amen. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Wonderful singing. You may be seated. We're going to sing one more song before the preaching. Number 153, I Surrender All. We're going to sing the first, the third, and the last of number 153. chapter number 11. Don't mark chapter number 11. The book of Mark, chapter number 11. Mark 11, we're going to look at verses 20 through 26 this evening. The title of the message is simple. God will take care of you. Mark chapter number 11, verse number 20. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, 7, 8. 9, 10, 11. You didn't need that part probably. Mark chapter 11, verse number 20. Let's pray together, please. Father, would you help us tonight? Shouldn't be a long message, but I think it'll be a helpful one. I know it's an important one, something that we need to remember more frequently than we do. You love us, you care about us, and you'll take care of us. Please bless the message and let it be a help. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. It's been an unusual couple of weeks, hasn't it? And I was out and about this week many different times. And something that I noticed a few times while I was out is I'd just be maybe carrying things from the car to the house or just getting in uh, somewhere. And there'd be a group of birds nearby. And the birds are chirping they sound happy and their song is pleasant 
And every time I've heard it, I don't know why, but it's stuck out to me. Maybe it's because it's early spring and the birds have just now come back and uh, from migrating, and, and so we haven't heard them in so long. And now it, the birds are chirping, but the roads are a little quieter and, and things are a little bit slower than we're used to them being. And every time I've heard them, I, I've had the reminder of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus said uh, that even a sparrow doesn't fall and die without the Heavenly Father taking note of it. And you, you're concerned about food and raiment. What shall we eat and what shall we drink? And he says, consider the lilies of the field. Consider the sparrows, how God clothes them and God feeds them. And how much more important are we to the Lord than a little sparrow is. So every time I hear the singing of the birds, God reassures me just a little bit, hey, I'll take care of you. Everything's going to be all right. Let's look at our text here, Mark chapter 11, verse number 20. The Bible says, And in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, saith unto him, Master, behold the fig tree, which thou cursest, is withered away. Earlier in this chapter, you would have read that Jesus and the disciples were walking along a road and Jesus was hungry. And he sees a fig tree down the road and a fig tree, this fig tree had leaves on it. And that's important because when it comes to fig trees and bearing fruit, fig trees will bear the figs before they get their leaves in even. And so Jesus is hungry and he sees a fig tree and he sees the fig tree has leaves and so he thinks, good. There's some figs on that tree I'll be able to eat. Except when he gets up to the tree, he sees there are no figs on the tree. Something's wrong with this fig tree, and so Jesus curses the tree. I don't mean he cussed at it. I mean he literally curses the tree. And so for the first time, Peter notices a miracle, but in a negative sense. Usually, when Jesus performs a miracle, good things happen. This time, he miraculously kills a tree. In fact, if you read Mark chapter 11, you would almost think that Jesus is in a bad mood. Because he's on his way to Jerusalem, he sees this fig tree, he's hungry, he finds out it doesn't have any figs, and he curses the fig tree. And then he goes into the temple, and he sits down, and he makes a whip and a scourge. And he goes into the temple and he drives out the money changers and runs them off and whips them and beats them and flips their table over. I don't know if that's hangry Jesus or what's going on here, but uh, it seems like this whole chapter Jesus has not been in a good mood. And so the next day after flipping over the tables and running out the money changers, he, they come back by this tree and it's withered and dead from the roots on up. And Peter takes notice of this and he says, Lord, this tree, you cursed it yesterday, and it's dead. Verse number 22. And Jesus answering, saith unto them, Have faith in God. That's kind of a strange response to a withered tree, isn't it? Jesus sees a tree. It doesn't have any fruit. He curses the tree. The next day, the tree's dead. And Peter says, Hey, the tree's dead. And Jesus says, have faith in God. Now, what he's saying is, anything you ask God for, God will provide it to you. And we're going to get ready to go into that in just a minute. Verse, well, let's talk about this. What does it mean to have faith in God? It means to trust that God will come through. We often talk about children trusting their parents, having faith in their parents. You wouldn't, you wouldn't hear a child say, I have great faith in my parents. But you'll have, you, you could, if you ask them, hey, if you asked your mom, I'm sorry, there's a wasp in the room. Did you see it? It just went that away. Oh, there's a couple of them. Warn me. Pastor Jesse got stung this morning. After church, he was talking to you, Ellen, or it looked like he was. 
Pastor Jesse started to do this Indian rain dance in the aisle. And I thought he was telling Ellen a story. But did you put your hand on the pew end? And, it, he, and there was a wasp there. He put his hand on the pew end, and it stung his hand, and he starts dancing around in the aisle. And I thought, Pastor Jesse, we're Baptists around here. We don't do that dancing thing. And then I thought maybe he was telling Ellen a story and he was getting, but then he, he said no, it was like molten lava. Just he put his hand on that pew and it, and it lit him up. I don't know, maybe that's the chastisement of the Lord. I'm not sure what's going on. But uh, hey, be careful. We're going to spend some time this week. Forget sanitizing. We're in wasp eradication business, all right? But uh, Russ, keep an eye. I saw it fly over by you. Uh, anyways, back to our regularly scheduled programming. You ask a child, you know, do you have faith in your parents? If you asked your parents for something you needed, what do you think would happen? They're going to say, well, they get it for me. Because they trust mom and dad are going to provide for their needs. When I was growing up as a kid, never once did I wonder if we were going to lose our house. Never once was I concerned that mom wasn't going to go to Hamity Brothers on grocery day. Huh? Never once was I concerned that I wasn't going to have a lunch to take to school. Never once was I concerned that uh, we weren't going to have a car to drive around in. Now, I'll tell you this. My parents used to be concerned about that because my dad worked for General Motors. He worked for Buick. And every summer of the world, for years, he got laid off. I mean, every summer of the world. And he would go file unemployment. And he would file subpay. And he'd get his subpay. And he'd get his unemployment. And sometimes... He was still laid off when he was running out of subpay and unemployment. And I, and I can remember back now as an adult them being worried about that. And hearing my mom say, you might need to go look for a job. We don't know how long this is going to last. And there was a time when he actually went and worked for Dover Overhead Door Company here in Flint and did work on installing garage doors and overhead doors at, at big companies and businesses and things like that. They worried about it. I never did. They wondered where they were going to get grocery money. I never did. They wondered whether they were not they're going to make the house payment. I never did. Why? I just had confidence they'd get it done. In fact, if they ever came to me and said, son, I know you're only eight, but money's tight around here. We're not sure how we're going to make the house payment. I would have said to them, figure it out and make it happen. Get it done because I'm counting on you. Amen? What do you want from me? I'm eight. I can't help you. Uh, but you know what? They got it done every time. God says, that's how I want you to trust me. I want you to trust that I'll get it done every time. By the way, you, I said it. We never missed a meal. We never missed a payment on the house. At least and that I know of. They, they still owned the house as up to five years ago before they sold it and moved. God took care of us, and my mom and dad made sure that our needs were met. And God will take care of you. He'll make sure that your needs are met, because that's the kind of God he is. And he wants you to trust him, just like a child trusts a parent. I was talking with one of our men today, and he said, my wife doesn't understand how I can just give things to God. He said, you know, sometimes... I'm worried about all my business, and I'm worried about making everything happen, and I'm doing everything I can. And when it just gets to the point of overwhelming me, I just look up and say, God, I can't handle this. It's yours. You're going to have to do it. He says, and God always does it. And he does always do it. You've just got to put it into his hands and not worry about it. Trust in God. Have confidence in God. That's what Jesus is saying have faith in God. Verse 23, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. First off, that's a weird prayer. Huh? Have you ever had that thought? You ever wake up in the morning and go, you know what? I need to move a mountain today. What kind of 
prayer is moving a mountain into the sea. It makes no sense, does it? Here's what it means. There's going to come a day when you're going to have to ask God to do something you never thought you'd have to ask Him to do. You hear me? Pay attention tonight, church, because we're in these times right now. There's going to come a time in your life when you're going to need to ask God to do something you never thought you'd have to ask Him to do. Can you imagine the disciples scratching their heads saying, ask God to remove a mountain into the sea? Why would I ever need that? Exactly. You're going to have to ask God someday for something you never dreamed you'd have to ask Him. You're going to have to be able to ask it in faith that he'll do it. There's two so-evers in here, and I love them. The first one is whosoever. Look at it again. Verse number 23. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed. So when it comes to prayers of faith, God is no respecter of persons. People ask me to pray for them all the time, and that's understandable. I'm their pastor, or they know I am a pastor. Uh, they know I walk with God. They know that I pray, and so they ask me to pray for them. Nothing wrong with that. You ought to ask people to pray for your needs and to, to pray for you. But sometimes people ask me to pray for them because they think I have a connection to God that they don't or can't have, and that's not true. The Pope this week said, you know, because of the virus, if you need to confess your sins, you can go ahead and do that directly to God. You don't have to come to confession to do it. Well, duh. The Bible said that for thousands of years. There is but one mediator between God and man, your local parish priest. No. There is but one mediator between God and man, Lord Jesus Christ. You have never had to go to confession. You have never had to sit in a weird little telephone booth and spill your guts to some weird little guy on the other side of a strange street. You say, you're being kind of disrespectful. Well, they should stop molesting children. Let's talk disrespect. It's not a game, people. Anyhow, before I get ugly tonight, uh, so, <clears throat> whosoever, anyone can go to God and be heard by God. Ask me to pray for you. Just don't think that God will hear me more than he'll hear you. I'm glad to pray for you. Just don't think that God puts any more stock in my prayer than he puts in your prayers. Now, don't take that as a negative and go, oh, no, if he only hears your prayers as much as he hears my prayers, we're doomed. No, what I'm saying is God hears your prayers. God wants you to pray. He does everything he can to get you to pray. He'll blow your life apart to get you to turn to him and talk to him. Huh? Might be what's behind some of this, you think? Sometimes we only come to God when we have a need. And so he says, you know, I haven't heard from my people in America for a while. Let's give them a need. Haven't heard from my people around the globe in a while. They're doing pretty well. They got cars in the driveway. The mortgage is paid. There's groceries in the cabinet. I might need to get their attention again. That's the first so ever. Whosoever, go down to the bottom end of the verse, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. So whosoever shall have whatsoever. That's not a bad prayer promise, is it? Anyone, God doesn't respect persons, anyone who goes to God can have whatsoever they ask. Now keep in mind, this still falls within the proper parameters of prayer. Alliteration, you don't get that much from me. Uh, proper parameters of prayer are what? Well, the will of God. You know, I wish my husband would get run over by a bus. I'm sick of living with the guy. God, let my husband get run over with a bus. Probably not going to get that prayer answered. 
you're just being selfish. We have not because we ask not. And we have not when we ask because we ask amiss, that we may consume it upon our lusts. God's not a genie in a lamp just looking to give you whatever you're lusting after. Oh, I'm sick of this car. I want a new car. God, give me a new car. Now, God will give you a new car if you need a new car, but he's not going to give you one just because you want one. But when you pray within the will of God, God says, I'll give anybody anything that they need. Verse number 24. God gives us a formula here. Therefore, I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. So here's the formula. Desire, pray, believe, have. Desire, pray, believe, have. What are desires born of? Needs. Jesus was hungry, right? Ah, oh, there's a fig tree. I'm hungry. He gets to the tree. Ah, oh, this tree's a bad tree. You lied to me. It's got leaves and no figs. Curse you, tree. The tree's dead. Jesus <clears throat> needed food, desired food. The tree wasn't able to provide it. He curses the tree. God honors the prayer of faith to curse the tree, the tree dies. Whatsoever things ye ask. I don't know exactly why that tree needed to be cursed. It may have been cursed so that Peter could ask about it the next day when it's dead. So that he could teach the disciples this principle of someday you're going to have a need and you're going to have to ask God for something you never dreamed you would have to ask for. Like a mountain being cast into the sea. But if you'll pray and believe, that mountain will be cast into the sea. It's good stuff. Let's keep moving here. Verse number 25. And when ye stand praying, forgive. If ye have aught against any, that means if you're bitter against someone or you're holding a grudge towards someone, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if ye do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. There are some protocols to prayer. There are some things that have to be right in order for God to hear our prayer. I remember being a little kid and fighting with my brother, not getting along, mistreating him. He's probably mistreating me. We're fighting. And then one of us would want something from our mother. And she'd say, don't come to me asking for anything. You, you can't even get along with your brother and behave. You just get out of here. Once you guys can treat each other right, then you can ask me for something. Pretty godly response, actually. I don't think she even knew it. Maybe she did. God does the same thing with you. I go to God and, God, help me. I need this. And he says, aren't you fighting with Adam? You go, yeah, but he's a jerk. God says, you know what? Go make it right. Forgive him. You forgive him, then I'll forgive you. Then we can talk. Here's, here's one of the protocols of prayer. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. That means when you're living in known sin that you're unrepentant of and not making an effort to get the victory over, God's not interested in answering your prayers. There are conditions to answer prayer. Oh, you mean I don't just get to act like a brat and get anything that I want? No. Brats shouldn't get what they want. And God doesn't give brats what they want. You know what, God? I'll just live however I want to live, and then when I need something, I'll ask you for it, and you'll give it to me. God says, not a chance. If you regard iniquity in your heart, I will not hear you. So, how do you get these whosoever asks whatsoever kind of answers? Well, number one, 
you have to make sure that your heart is right toward other people. You can't be holding grudges, bitter against people. You have to forgive people. Why do I have to forgive people? So that God will then forgive you. Well, why do I need God to forgive me? Because he won't hear your prayers until your sins are forgiven. There's a lot of homework to do here, isn't there? See, we just think it's rub the lamp, the genie God pops out, he'll give us whatever we want. No, your heart's not right. You're not going to get anything you want. By the way, once your heart's right, you start asking for different stuff, too. You will ask your husband to get hit by a bus. When you forgive your husband for the way he, you know, the reason you guys aren't getting along, and then you confess your sin, and God forgives you of your sin. So now you've forgiven your husband, and you realize how much God's forgiven you. The last thing you want is for him to get hit by a bus now. Nobody gives up when they're on top. They only quit when they're on the bottom. Your boss calls you into the office. Man, you've been working here a long time. You're doing a really great job. We're going to double your salary. You go, that's it. I quit. Nobody does that. Boss calls you in and says, you seem to be slacking a little bit. What's going on? I tell you what, if you don't get with it, you're going to find yourself without a job. Ah, that's it. I quit. That's when you quit. Honey, the last 20 years we've been married has been the most wonderful 20 years of my life. I couldn't imagine life without you. You're so spectacular as a spouse, and, and I, hope, I, hope, uh, I hope we live, have the next 20 years together. But having said that, I'd like a divorce. Nobody does that. Ah, you left your socks on the floor. Ah, you left your pantyhose on the shower curtain rack. Ah, I hate you. I hate you. Let's get a divorce. Bye, bye me. That's when you do it. You get your heart right with God. You get your heart right with other people. You start asking for different things. God says, I won't even hear you until your sins are forgiven. And I'm not going to forgive you until you've forgiven other people. Let's keep going. A clean heart is necessary for such prayers. Forgive others so you can be forgiven and you can get your prayers answered. It's a strange time in our lives. I don't know that we've ever seen anything like this before. Maybe older generations have, those who went through World War II and even times such as the 50s and 60s, the civil rights movement and uh, Korean conflict, Vietnam War, things like that. But us young folks, young guys like me, this is a first for me. I've only got a couple of those JFK moments, you know what I mean? When, he, when you ask someone who was alive when JFK was shot, where were you when that happened? They can tell you. Where were you when, when man landed on the moon? They can tell you. I've got 9-11. That's one of those JFK moments. I've got the, the space shuttle exploding. That's one of those JFK kind of moments. And now apparently I've got a virus, a coronavirus. Where were you during COVID-19? Huh? This is something we'll never forget. This is something that's making an indelible impression upon our lives, our minds, our memories. We're going to remember this for a very long time in your interiors. It's strange. So let me ask you. What are you going to need during this time? You don't even know, do you? You might need a mountain cast into the sea. That's my point tonight. What are you going to need in the next month? You know, we try to look down the road, and people are being laid off of work. You might need a job. You dead sure is going to need some money. You're going to need some bills paid. I got this email uh, the other day. You want to you wanna, you wanna, uh, postpone your car payment? Honestly, I had the money in the bank. You know what I did? Yes. Yes, I do. Because I don't know what's coming down the pipe. You're going to let me you're gonna let me postpone it? Yes. Postpone it is. I don't know. I had prayed about it. Lord, what should I do here? Postpone it. I'll do that. Postponed it. And uh, so I got that going for me. You say, why'd you postpone it? You had the money in the bank to pay it. Because I don't know what's coming. I want to prepare. I want to be 
wise. I want to be smart. I don't know. I might need a mountain cast into the sea. I want to make sure that my heart is right with other men and women. I don't want to be holding grudges. Adam, I forgive you. I hope you'll forgive me. Let's make this right. Why? So I can go to God and say, God, there's sin in my life and I don't want it there. I'm struggling with it. I want to overcome it. Forgive me. I want to stay right with you. Why? So that if I ever need a mountain cast into the sea, I can go to God and say, God, remember when you said whatsoever we asked? I got a big one that I never saw coming and I never thought I'd be asking you for this. But will you please do this for me? I'm going to tell you something. And this will sound boastful. It shouldn't at all but I, I want to say it to encourage you. God answers my prayers. You say, why does he answer your prayers? Well, because he promised he would if I prayed. I can't take any credit for God answering my prayers because he says he'll answer whosoever's prayers. The only difference between me getting my prayers answered and you not getting your prayers answered if you're not getting prayers answered is I'm probably praying and you're not. I don't know. I'm not trying to be ugly or rude. I'm trying to teach a principle here. If you want prayers answered, you have to pray. And you have to be willing to have faith enough to ask God for mountains to be cast into the sea if they need to be. I have a prayer that was answered recently that I can't even tell anybody about, but it was huge, man. It was monumental. And God answered it. And hallelujah, praise God that he did. You know what it was? A mountain cast into the sea kind of prayer. And I never dreamed I would have to ask that prayer. But I asked it. And you know what God did? Cast it into the sea. Hallelujah. God is faithful. Have faith in God. Our country's growing through something very few of its citizens have been through before. Quarantine. Never heard of quarantine going on in our country before. I've heard of sick people quarantine. I've, I've talked to some older folks that were around when polio was still pretty prevalent. More alliteration for you. And they said, yeah, people would have signs on their doors or in their yards even, you know, please do not approach the house. Polio. And so we used to take sick people and quarantine them. But with this, they tell us we don't know who's sick. know it. And then I hear something like that, and I don't know how much of that to believe. Because it also sounds like something you could use to control and manipulate people. And it also could be the truth. I just don't know. And so uh, we were in this weird space, quarantine. What else? The scarcity of goods. I'll tell you this, I've never worried about needing a square of toilet paper in my life. And I'll tell you this, we just happen to have some. I shouldn't have told you, you're going to rob my house. We just happen to have some. And I'll tell you, I've not even been looking for it. Because I got some, and I just trust that when I need some again, there'll be some more. I don't know. Maybe I'll just go to the gas station. Who knows? But uh, I've never had to worry about toilet tissue in my whole life. And now... It's hard to find. We were talking to a lady at a, at a store yesterday, and she said, uh, we're rationing toilet tissue because people are trying to buy all of it. The United States of America, its stores are rationing goods. That's new for us. I was alive during the gasoline shortage, but I was just a toddler. I don't know what it was like. Some of you remember those days. Some of you remember the lines at the gas stations. Some of you remember seeing gas stations with signs out front that said, closed, out of gas. Go ask Nixon for some. Huh? I don't remember those days. Anytime I've ever needed gas, there's been a pump with it ready to fill me up, right? And now we're running out of stuff. Our country doesn't know what that's like. Shannon loves to use those Clorox wipes to clean the house with. She's out of Clorox wipes. She's got to be old-fashioned and 
use 409 and paper towels. What's this world coming to? Huh? Scarcity of goods. I was reading a book by a gentleman who had friends in Russia, and these, uh, these friends were, they had a decent position with the government. They worked for someone in the government, and so they had a little bit of money. And this man and his wife flew to Russia to visit this family. And he said, what I had heard of their job and their position, and I thought, oh, well, these folks are pretty well off. He said, but when we got to their home, they just lived in a little apartment. Couldn't have been more than 600 square feet. And when we got there, the wife was really excited about serving us dinner because she had found some potatoes, and we were going to have baked potatoes. She said, let me show you my prized possession. She wheeled a cart out from another room, and there was a cloth draped over the cart. She removed the cloth, and it was a microwave. This man said, this lady's prized possession was a microwave. And I'm not talking, I'm talking this was the 90s, 20, 30 years ago. We got a microwave at our house. We're ready to throw it out to the curb because it's leaving too many unpopped popcorn kernels at the end of the cycle. We're mad at our microwave. She's got hers on a cart covered up with a cloth. Huh? It's not the same every That lady made them dinner and was so excited and happy she made baked potatoes in her microwave. Later on, they brought that Russian family to the United States. They took them to a supermarket. And that man writing this book said, when that lady walked into the supermarket, tears began to stream down her he thought something was wrong. He said, you know, what, what is it? What's wrong? She said, I've never seen this much food in one place in my entire life. We don't know what we have. You have to go somewhere else to find out that it's not like this everywhere. You know, we're not very well traveled. We've been to Canada kind of like America light diet America. Uh, they got funny money, colored money, ladies on it, see-through windows, stuff like that. But it's kind of like going to Disneyland, Canada is. Mexico is different. It's not America light. It's Mexico. You can't drink the water or you'll vomit all over. In the morning, outside of our hotel, the day is fresh and new and everything's wonderful. By about 2.30 in the afternoon, you realize there's raw sewage running underneath the sidewalk right next to your hotel because you smell it really well. The Walmart over there, when you see the meat hanging in open air, you see the fish laying out in the open air without any ice. You realize you're not at home anymore. When you go soul winning and you meet a man who's in his 50s and he's barefoot and his feet look like nothing you've ever seen before and you can't help but keep glancing down and your Spanish soul winning partner's been talking to the guy in Spanish and you, can know, you know they're talking about you and your soul winning partner just looks at you and says he doesn't own any shoes because he noticed you And then he says, he's 54 years old, and he's never owned a pair of shoes. You realize you're not in America anymore. We don't know how good we have it. Whatever will we do? I don't know. But I know that God will take care of us. God will take care of you. Jesus' ministry occurred
during a time of Roman occupation in Israel. Isn't that interesting? The king of Israel, while he was alive, had an opposing nation occupying his land. You ever think about that? Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, he who would sit on the throne of David while he lived in his land, that he is the King of, the Romans occupied it. In fact, when they come up to him and said, carry my pack a mile, his country that he was the ruler of. It's not always like this. Now, I'll be honest with you, my flesh wants it to stay like it is. Comfortable. Plentiful. Abundant. But it might not. What will you do? I don't know. But God will take because God always takes care of his people. The Israelites left Egypt. And I can, I can see it now. Moses approaches the Israelites. Hey, you people tired of living in Egypt as slaves? Yeah! You ready to get out of this place and, and become a free people? Yeah! Are you ready to, to walk on out of here and march into the middle of the desert, in the middle of nowhere with nothing to your name? Well, wait a minute. Not necessarily. And how bad do you want your freedom? Ten plagues pass. After the Passover and the death angel and the death of the firstborn, Pharaoh said, get out of here, Israel. We don't want you here anymore. The Egyptian or the Israelites are thinking, well, how will we live? You know what happened? The Egyptian people said, we're sick of you being here. Here's a U-Haul trailer full of stuff. Go. They gave them their own possessions. I can see some of these ladies, these Jewish ladies. Well, how will I cook supper? This Egyptian woman says, here. Here's a whole set of pot and pans. Just go. Huh? How am I going to mow the grass? Here. Here's a John Deere lawnmower. Get out of here. There's no grass in the desert. Anyway, right? They sent them down the road full of stuff. Just go. Why? God takes care of his people. They were walking through the desert, and they were thinking, hey, where are we going to get clothes? There's no Walmarts or J.C. Penney's around here. God said, I already thought about it. I'm going to take care of you. As your children grow, their clothes will grow with them. As their feet grow, their shoes will grow with them. As you grow, your shirts will grow with you. I wish that still happened today. Amen? Huh? You need clothes, Israelites? No, God's got it taken care of. They're not going to wear out. You're good. Well, what in the, what in the world are we going to eat? I bet they never thought, I'm going to have to ask God for food someday. God said, don't worry about it. Magic food is going to fall out of the sky. And all you have to do is go outside in the morning and gather some up every day. By the way, only take enough for one day. I want you to have fresh magic food every day. And he did for years. They said, what if we get sick of this magic food and we want some meat? I can get you meat. Now we really want meat. The magic food's not doing it anymore. We've had manna stew and fried manna and baked manna, and we've, we've made manna into pasta, and uh, we've made manna pizzas and, and manna cereal, and we're just, we want something different. Here, here's quail. So much quail, it's going to make you sick. What else you want? Well, what are we going to drink? I got you covered there. See that rock over there? Yeah. What if I move it? Is there a spring under it? No, there's a spring in the middle of it. Moses is going to go over there, he's going to speak to the rock, and water is going to gush forth from the rock. These are crazy stories, aren't they? And they happen for the children of Israel. 
You know what they're akin to? Mountains being cast into the sea. Hey, God, I need some water out of this rock. That's weird. Never thought you'd ask for that before. Never thought I'd ask for that before. Okay, but you're a whosoever, and you ask a whatsoever, here's your water. Huh? God, I'm hungry. Want some magic food? Magic food? I can make food fall from the sky. What, am I going to shoot a duck? No. Watch this. <whistles> food on the ground. Huh? God takes care of his people. You say, but I don't see how. They didn't see how manna was going to fall from the sky. Well, I don't see how. They didn't know how water would flow from the rock. Well, I don't see how. They don't know how their clothes didn't wear out. Well, I don't see how. Well, they didn't know how their shoes were going to grow. Quit figuring, trying to worry about the how and just tell God what you need. Even if it's a weird request like this, mountains being cast into the sea. If God can take care of a few million people in the desert, he'll take care of you. Let me just give you a couple of things. How to handle this period of time in our lives. Number one, get saved. If you're not a Christian, you need to become a Christian tonight. If you're not sure you're on your way to heaven when you die, you need to make sure of that tonight. If you're not a child of God, you need to become a child of God tonight. During our invitation, we'll all be standing. Brother Dix will come to play the piano. Brother Jesse will be down front. If you're here and you don't know for certain you're on your way to heaven when you die, march down this aisle with the rest of everybody else that's going to come, shake his hand and say, I need to get saved. You say, saved from what? Saved from hell. Saved from your sins. Saved to heaven. You need to get saved if you're not a Christian. If you've never, if you can't remember a day in your life when you put your faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, if you've never put your trust in what he did on the cross at Calvary for you, you need to do that. Salvation is more than just believing that Jesus existed. It means going to him personally and saying, Jesus, I know you're the son of God. I know that you died for my sins. I know that you rose from the dead three days later. And I'm asking you to forgive me of my sin and to save my soul from hell. I'm putting my confidence in you, my trust in you, my faith in you to save me tonight. You need to do that. Number two. Work all of this together for good. Romans 8, 28. And we know all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Work all this together for good. I'll tell you, you know what the, the pre prevailing thing that God has brought to my attention is? Man, I move way too fast. Now, I've always said this. I'd rather do three things at a level 8 than one thing at a level 10. You know what I'm saying? I'd rather, I'd rather do three things really well than one thing perfectly. But you know what I think has been going on in my life at least? I think I've been doing like 178 things at a four and a half. And I don't think that's good. I think I need to tr figure out how to do like 81 things at a seven and a half. I think I need to slow down a little bit. I didn't say do less. Start choosing better. Because there's some things in my life that don't need to be there. I mean, I'll, I'll break it to Nicole and Winston later, but, you know, I'm just kidding. Uh, there's some things that I, I spend time on I don't need to spend time on. There's some things that I allow to have my attention that don't deserve my attention. Cut it out. Give my time and attention to something better. <clears throat> slow your schedule down but keep God preeminent let me tell you what's happened in America as our affluence has risen we have started engaging in activities and entertainment that we didn't used to be able to afford I'll, I'll tell you this man we never had cable TV when I was growing up we had antennas and half the time I had to stand there holding it because they got better reception 
when I was part of the antenna, right? <laughs> NBC, ABC, CBS, and PBS, and once in a while, Channel 20 from Detroit came in. We had four or five channels. That's all we had. And you know what? When something came on you didn't want to watch, you, you didn't have YouTube to go to and Hulu to go to and Netflix to go to. You just shut the TV off and went and did something else. But now, man, the opportunities are endless. We used to have three TV networks. There are probably 300,000 options, maybe millions. I don't know. Every account on YouTube is its own channel these days. It's crazy. It's too much. Man, I remember getting a VCR. And I thought, man, because we never went to the movies. Movies were too expensive to go to. We never even went. It wasn't that, oh, we went to the movies, we just didn't buy the popcorn. No, we didn't go to the movies. It was too much. And so my parents were talking about this new machine that you could play movies at home. Because the way that it worked, you got a TV guide in the mail every week. And you flip through the TV guide and you go, oh, my goodness, Star Wars is on Saturday night at 8 o'clock. I've never seen Star Wars, and it's on Saturday night at 8 o'clock. And then your mom would say, we're going to be at your grandmother's Saturday night. And you'd go, no. You say, well, why does that matter? Because it never come on again. Movies came on TV one time, and they never came on again. And like if you had a show like the Dukes of Hazard, you watched the Dukes of Hazard every single week, and you missed a week of the Dukes of Hazard, that was it. You couldn't just... You know, stream it. It's gone. Maybe during the summer when they did reruns, maybe you catch it again. But let's not fool ourselves. You'll never see it because you, you were outside during the summertime. You didn't sit around watching reruns during the summertime because it was still daylight until 10 o'clock at night. So that means you'd never see it. Funny thing is, you could see it now if you wanted to, but you don't care because there's other things, right? We just have too much money. VCRs, it costs like five bucks to rent a movie for one night. One night, you better watch it that night. You didn't watch it that night, you got to turn it the next day. It's just the way that it was. And if you lose that tape, $90. No $5 bin DVD thing at Walmart. $90 if you lost a VHS tape. $90? So you'd go to the video store, and you'd find that they had three copies of the movie you wanted to watch, and they were all out. And you'd say to the clerk, clerk, When's this movie going to be back in? And they go clickety-clack. Oh, it's reserved for three more weeks. Can I put my name down? Yeah, you can have it in August. And you're like, okay. And then they'd call you. Your movie's in. And you go, man, my movie's in. And you'd go and you'd rent it for $5, take it home, watch it, and then return it the next day. It's the way it worked. Now, man, Disney Plus. And all we're doing, you know, you say, boy, why doesn't anyone compose symphonies like Beethoven anymore? Because they're all watching Netflix. The people that could do it are watching TV. They're stuck on their phone. They're scrolling nonsense. Stupid memes and ridiculous. But you've seen it all already. The next person can show me a, a COVID-19 meme that I haven't seen yet, I'll give you a dollar. It's, it's all been done. We're all seeing the same stuff. Even in our family, Shannon will come up to me, oh, you see this one? I'm like, yeah, I saw that one. And I'll go to her, yeah, you see this one? Yeah, I saw that one. We're stupid. Slow your schedule down. Keep God preeminent. Here's what we've done. As the affluence has risen, we've said, well, man, I really want to keep doing this, but I don't have time to do this and everything else that I have. Where can I cut back? And here's what we do. God won't notice, and we cut him out. And then we're able to do something else. We go, man, uh, if I keep doing this and this and then this too, where am I going to find time to fit this in? Maybe God won't notice, and we cut some more off of it. We just keep whittling away at what we give God until he gets nothing. Evangelists used to come to town and hold this is, I'm not making a story up. This is reality. 30-day meetings. Church, 30 nights in a row. And just saying that, you're all like, oh, who could tolerate that? They, they loved it. 
You know why? If nothing else, it was something to do. Well, chickens have been fed, the cows have been milked, the stalls have been cleaned out, we had dinner, we washed the dishes, we dug a new hole for the outhouse. What's there to do now? They're having a revival in town. Hey, let's go. 30 days in a row. Then revival meetings went to two weeks. Then we cut back to one week meetings. Churches nowadays, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday meetings. Monday and Tuesday, crowd's barely there. Why? I got stuff to do, man. My kid plays travel ball. Huh? I'm on the PTA. Oh, my kid's got science fair. Anything and everything but the Lord. Then our kids grow up, they graduate high school, they move out of our house, and for the first two or three months, every time we hear the door swing open, as parents we turn and look to see if that's our kid, and it never is. And then we figure out after the first two or three months, they're never coming back. And we say, why doesn't my kid have an appetite for church and the Lord? Because we fed them nothing but the world and entertainment. If all you give your kid is ice cream, then when you want them to sit down and have some broccoli, they don't want it. What's better for them? Broccoli. What are they going to eat? The ice cream. You cannot serve two masters. You'll love the one and hate the other. And that's what we're seeing happen. Slow your schedule down. Keep God preeminent. Number two, back away from news and social media. Man, slide that. Back away from news and social media. I'm going to tell you this. You already know all there is to know. Watching the news tonight is not going to tell you anything more. You, social media, I think we're going to start. I may as well tell you. Here's what we're going to do next week. Next Sunday, when we start the service, we're going to initiate a social media fast for one week. I'm giving you one week heads up so you can glutton all week long on it. All right, post till your heart's content. And truth be told, I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not communist. I'm not going to run around. If I see you post, well, first off, that'll mean I'm on, right? <laughs> I can't do that. I'm not going to drive over to Michael's house and slap his phone out of his hand. Mike, we're on a fast. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> okay, Brother Jesse's got the, got the young man and Mike. Uh, the team. So, next Sunday, how about it? Let's do it. Next Sunday. Get it all in this week. Next Sunday, dropping the hammer. But you know what? Back away from it. It's not helping you. Let me ask you this. How many times have you been scrolling and you were perfectly good mood, perfectly happy, you saw something or read something that made you depressed? Why do you keep doing it? I mean, if you had a neighbor that every time you knocked on his door, he punched you in the nose... You'd stop knocking on his door. But yet you go back to, to Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and you keep going to the same stuff. Getting punched in the face over and over again, but you won't learn. They say that's the definition of insanity. Anyhow, let's hurry. We've got to be done. Keep your focus on important things. God, your health, your family, your finances. Don't be reckless. Something this is going to teach us real quickly is how well you've been managing your money. Some of you are going to be broke and penniless fast because you've never saved a penny. You're going to be hurting, and you're going to go without. Change how you manage money. We had staff meeting this week. I told the staff, shut it down. Shut it down. I don't know what's going to happen. Offerings are probably going to start slipping. Folks aren't coming to church. If they're not here, they're not going to be given. Some folks give online. Some folks don't or won't. No spending. Figure it out now. We don't have it. Oh, but, but we do have No, no, no. That's not there. Pretend it's not there. It doesn't exist. We don't have it. Shut it down. Why? It's reckless. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Storehouse of the wise are gold and 
oil, but a foolish man spendeth all that he hath. The Bible teaches it's wise to save and foolish to spend everything you have. Get on top of your finances. Next, number three, trust God. Hey, Abraham, you're going to have a baby. Sarah says, baby, I'm 90. <laughs> and God says, is anything too hard for the Lord? That means mountains being cast into the sea, by the way. It's not too hard for the Lord. That means whatsoever ye ask. That means that prayer you never thought you were going to have to ask, it's not too hard for the Lord. Jews tempted God. They're in the wilderness, and he's done all this stuff for them. He's done the manna and the clothes and the, and the water. And then they ask, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Stop asking, can God? And start saying, God can believeth. He that believeth the Bible says. Number four, turn your can gods into God cans. Let's stand. Father, help us. We're late. We're over time. We needed this tonight. Bless our invitation. Bless your people, please. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The piano plays. The altar is open. You come. He's not hit a key yet, but that's okay. You can come. It'll play in a second. Don't waste the time. Come do business with the Lord. He spoke to your heart. He wants you to move. Let's go. This is too important. Thank you for your attention. You may be seated. Ushers, would you come forward, please? Let's receive our offering at this time. Please be faithful and generous in your giving. Uh, as long as you're receiving income, I hope you'll be faithful to tithe on that income. Of course, if you don't have income coming in, then you can't tithe off of it, right? It doesn't exist. It's not there. But please be faithful. Honor God. He'll bless you for it. He'll never let those who are faithful to give go without. Uh, you can't out stay faithful through this time. Pastor Jesse, would you pray?
announcement, and I'll have you on your way if you'd like the others. There are bulletins on the Welcome Center down in the foyer. All the announcements come right out of the bulletin, so feel free to grab one. But I did make a little card up, and I did steal this, uh, borrowed it. I was encouraged to use it. We'll put it that way. But uh, I, I think it's a really good idea. They're on the table here by the Stewardship Bank, which, by the way, we're going to continue through the 1st of April. But this is just a little card to reach out to folks that might have some need during this time, whether it be in need of prayer or someone to maybe run to the store for them. There are so many folks that may have some needs and can't get out or are concerned about getting out, and maybe we can help them. There's a place just to put your name and your cell phone number, and that'll mean they'll call you and ask you to help with their need, whether it be praying for them or, or running an errand. If you read the card, it'll be explanatory to you. And then my email address is on here. It says if you need a pastor's help, just email that, and then I'll try to help folks as I can as well. And I'm not talking about paying people's bills for them or, you know, doing that kind of thing. I'm talking about someone who generally has a need. So Nicole the other day was on the bus route, and uh, a, a family reached out to her and said, you know, we need a gallon of milk. Is there any way you could help us get a gallon of milk? And so she ran that to them. And Shannon's been doing things like that as well. So I think I just died, didn't I? All right, let's stand up. We'll pray and be dismissed. Father, we love you. Thank you for your goodness to us. Help us to live the gospel this week. Keep us healthy, please. Keep us safe. I pray that this would pass soon, but not without having the effect you've wanted it to have. We love you and praise you, and we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. You're dismissed. See you later.